Hari Om, everyone. Welcome back to the Lalita Sahasranama class. Om Sindhu Raharuna Vigraham Trinayanam Manikya Maulis Purat Tarana Yakashekharam Smitamukhi Mapi Navakshoruham Pani Bhyamalipur Naratna Chashakam Raktot Palam Bibratim Soumyam Ratnagatastha Rakta Charanam Dhyayet Paramam Vikam Dhyayet Padmasanastham Vikasita Padanam Padma Patrayata Kshim Hema Bham Pita Vastram Katakalita Lasadhema Padmam Varangim Sarva Lankara Yuktam Satatama Bhayadam Bhaktadam Bram Bhavanim Shri Vidyam Shantamurtim Sakala Suradutam Sarva Sampat Pradatrim Sakunkum Avilepanam Alikachum Vikasturikam Samanda has it ekshanam, such a rachapa pasham kusham. Ashe shachanamo hini marudamal yabhusham varam. Japa kusubabhasuram, japa vidhus maridam bikam. Arunam karuna tarangita kshim. Dritta pasham kushapushpabana chapam. Anima di bira vritam mayu kehirahamitye Bhavanim. So once more, we meet the Supreme Divine Mother, our very own consciousness, in the center of our heart through the following visualization. We turn our mind inwards towards itself. And there, in the center of our heart, there is a boundless ocean of nectar. Nectar is pure white light with all the colors of the rainbow shining in it, like an opal stone. And this ocean is absolutely boundless. And in the center of this ocean is the island of jewels living, breathing jewels. Wish-fulfilling jewels. And in the center of this island, there is a garden of hibiscus trees. A vast park And in the center of this forest park, there is a large lake filled with lotuses. And they are all blossoming. They all have a thousand petals, which represents the thousand petals of our uppermost chakra. And in the center of this lotus lake is the Sri Chakra as a palace, shining in pure gold. It has nine layers a palace with nine layers to reach the center. 
And as we pass through each compartment, we meet powerful goddesses, yoginis, who embody different functions, faculties, capacities of consciousness. They embody our full potential, our potential for love, kindness, beauty, aesthetics, harmony, music, elegance, gracefulness, intuition, strength, courage, fearlessness, energy. Boundless qualities are present in these layers, in these compartments of the Shri Chakra that forms the palace of the Divine Mother. And then we reach the very center of this mandala, the very center, the center, central point of all existence within our heart where there is the ocean of nectar. We are now in the very, very center. And there, in the very middle of the Sri Chakra palace, the Divine Mother rests upon Shiva. Shiva is absolute existence, boundless presence. And the Divine Mother is absolute consciousness energy. Through this consciousness energy, Chitti Shakti, all things come into existence. The smallest and the largest, beginning with our very own bodies, emotions, thoughts, which moment to moment are pulsating, changing, flowing forth from consciousness. You can witness this yourself. If you are just silent for a moment, you can see how every moment, every instant, a new impulse, a new emotion, a new thought, a new sensation is arising from consciousness. And likewise, externally, every moment, new worlds, new living beings come into existence. So here we have reached the Divine Mother, Lalita, the playful one, the playful, creative goddess, who is our own consciousness. And we are describing the names, many of which are quite symbolic, using ancient Indian ideals of beauty and poetry and aesthetics to describe her. Marali Mandagamana. Her gait, her movement, her way of walking is like that of a swan, slow and gentle. If you have ever observed a swan walking, it's quite a rare sight because usually we encounter swans swimming, not walking. But I several times have had the fortune of seeing a swan come out of the water and then walk. And because I know this name, I was able to observe the gait, the way that beautiful creature was walking. It is a most elegant sight, something to really 
and joy. And the symbolism here is that someone who can walk with such elegance really embodies all the graceful qualities and also fearlessness. To walk with such grace means also to be fearless, to be a supreme queen. And an even deeper meaning is that the swan's movement represents the movement of our kundalini energy. This is the subtle energy that is present in our subtle body. And when we are completely pure, when our meditation practices, our mantra practices, our concentration practices, our awareness has purified us, then this energy begins to rise up to the top of our being. And this movement is also a little bit like the gait of a swan. It is not forceful. People imagine Kundalini awakening to be very forceful and something shocking and shaking. It is not like that. It is very smooth, very gentle. Mahalavanya Shivati. She is the treasure house of beauty. Lavanya means endless beauty. And she is the treasure house of beauty. Shankaracharya says that even the supreme gods struggle to describe her unequaled beauty. In the Sundariya Lahari, he says, O oh, Devi, even distinguished poets like Brahma, the creator, struggle in their attempt to describe your beauty. When one attains union with Shiva, absolute existence, which is attainable only through deep, deep spiritual practice, then one encounters your unparalleled beauty. That is what Shankaracharya says. So again and again, if you wish to approach this Divine Mother in your heart, exalt yourself by visions of beauty, greater and greater beauty, the very essence of beauty. It is said that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. And here, this is all the more true, since this ultimately is your true nature that is being described. You see, this is the skillfulness of this ancient Sri Vidya tradition that your own true nature is being described as if it were an external goddess, when in reality it is your true nature, our true nature that is being described. I once knew someone who said, oh, I, I wish that I were as beautiful as the Prasundari. And that, of course, made me chuckle because the whole point is that you are her. She is you in your innermost potential, in your innermost nature. Sarvaruna means that she is totally, completely rosy red, like the morning sun. We recently had a very beautiful dawn a couple of days ago, which was finally a change from this grey winter we are in. And if you have ever seen an amazing dawn, 
you will understand why the Divine Mother is described as being completely rosy red like dawn. Dawn is the first moment when the darkness of the night is overcome. Similarly, the Divine Mother's rising, her manifestation, is the first moment when ignorance, the darkness of ignorance, is overcome. The rosy red color also represents bliss. In the Agamas, the Tantra texts, colors have different meanings. For example, the color yellowish gold represents prosperity, wealth, nourishment, growth. And the color rosy red represents bliss. The color red, rosy red, also represents creativity. The rajasic nature, rajasic is the creative nature that seeks to make something, produce something. And the Divine Mother is that creative energy after all. She is Chitti Shakti. She is not only resting like Shiva, who is Sattva, pure resting. She is active. Your consciousness is creating all the time. Phenomena as vast as space, infinitely vast, are created moment to moment by consciousness, through consciousness. This is also one of the meanings of the rosy red color. Anavadhyangi. Her limbs are beyond reproach. Again, an allusion to her beauty. There is nothing that could be complained about regarding her appearance. Whatever is perfect is already inherently present in her. Everything is absolutely wonderful, irreproachable. Many of us don't like our appearance or we seek to improve it. Oh, if only my nose were not so long. I remember many years ago, there was a little boy, the brother of one of our good friends, and children have this tremendous honesty and straightforwardness. So I remember he looked at me while we were taking food in our Austria ashram, and he said, Pitya Vaska, your nose is like that of a pig. And of course, there were many other people present, so I had never thought of that. <laughs> and then I looked in the mirror and I thought, yeah, he's right, there is some, there is some similarity. <laughs> but the Divine Mother's manifestation is absolutely irreproachable. It's absolutely perfect. So all our human faults, our human imperfections are transcended when we approach her, when we meditate on our true nature. We go beyond these physical limitations, at least temporarily. Physical limitations also mean bodily pains and aches and all the complaints that we have. But when we approach our true nature, this boundless treasure house of beauty, of irreproachable appearance, then temporarily we transcend these limitations. Or we at least see that they are not so important, that there is something infinitely more vast than these limitations. 
Sarvabharana Bhujita. She's adorned with all adornments, with all jewelry. So again, anything that we consider to be jewelry, to be something that beautifies us, is present in the Divine Mother. So now her external form has been described in the preceding names up to here. Now her seat is described in the next name, Shivakami Shvarankastha. She sits upon the lap of Shiva, the Lord of Love the one who overcame desire. It's very symbolic. Shiva and the Divine Mother only found each other when Shiva overcame desire. It is then that their union took place. Similarly, the Kundalini energy in our subtle body can only rise to the top when we overcome desire. When desire does not drive us, when we understand it to be an energy of creativity that is present in us but does not bind us. When, however, we are driven by desire, when desire is our Lord, it is impossible for the energy of consciousness to meet Shiva, to merge with Shiva, to rest upon Shiva. Then the energy of consciousness is agitated by those desires, or rather we could say, is drawn in by those desires and the mind manifests. Now, this is a very subtle point. There's a subtle difference between the energy of consciousness and mind. Mind is that which is constantly volatile and driven by desires. So when consciousness the energy of consciousness is drawn in by desires, it becomes mind. And desires are very subtle. The desire to survive, the desire to be immortal, never to die. These are, can barely be overcome, can they? They are instinctive to us. But this is the teaching, that when desire is transcend it, when we understand it to be just a creative energy in us rather than our master, it is then that we can realize our true nature. And this is really the truth. It was also taught by the Buddha. The source of suffering is desire, unceasing, tireless desiring which is taking us away from our true nature. Thus the Divine Mother, who is the fullness of our potential, rests upon Shiva, who has overcome desire, who is the Lord of love. And thus she herself is known as Shiva. Now here we have to dwell with this name for a while, even though I promise to move faster, because this is a highly important name. Of course, all the names are important. It 
is important to know what Shiva really means. It has several possible meanings. One is she in whom the auspicious is present. She in whom we find or discover auspiciousness. Kalyana. Another meaning is she who reduces negative states. Shyati Ashubham. What are the negative states? All the states which narrow our mind. I am so important. It's all about me or my clan or my tribe or my people. I am the center of the world. My achievements are all that matter. And then derived from this self-centeredness, jealousy, envy, feeling secretly inferior to others and the endless cycle that these emotions bring about. These are what we know as negative states. And the Divine Mother, the boundless love that she is, reduces these negative states. So concretely, whenever any negative state arises, if you give rise instantly to their opposite, which is love, maitri, if you give rise to their opposite, you reduce those states. Only the positive can dissolve the negative. I just read this today in one of Sri Swami Omkarananda's texts where he says, only the positive can dissolve the negative. So when you are in negative states of mind, instantly give rise to positive states of mind. The positive ones are your true innermost potential with which you are engaging. So the solution to anger, jealousy, envy, selfishness is instantly maitri, karuna, love, compassion. And you, your mind has the ability to do that. You're not the victim of your mind. You can direct your mind to generate these. And then Shiva also means she in whom all the qualities reside. And one of the most beautiful meanings ever is she in whom everything rests or reclines with ease. It is like relaxing into the lap of our mother or our beloved, reclining with ease. She in whom everything rests. And this too is highly important to understand. We can only know our true nature, the Divine Mother, if we learn to rest. To rest from the endless agitation that is going on around us, to rest our senses, to rest our body, to rest our emotions, to rest our mind, then we can know our true nature. Our Guru said that from a state of absolute calmness and rest come all the blessings. Whereas from a state of agitation comes all the trouble. Please remember this always. 
from a state of rest and calmness come all the blessings. This is the meaning of Shiva. And then the next name is something for all the ladies among you. Svadhina Vallabha. She keeps her husband under her control. <laughs> it's, it's true. That is what the text says. Shiva is like a corpse without her. Absolute existence is nothing without consciousness. You see? Existence by itself is completely dead. Only when the energy of consciousness is present does existence even mean something. Otherwise, it's just an inert presence. And many, many of the scriptures make it very clear that all the gods even and all beings are capable of their activities only because of the energy of consciousness, the Divine Mother. And the name is also interpreted to mean she who blesses wives with dominance over their spouses. So she's the supreme feminist. I have always said that the tradition, the Srividya tradition, is one of the most feminist traditions possible. It's all about the power of women, the female power being the absolute power, because it is the motherly power, and the female qualities being our real qualities. Compassion is our true nature. Love is our true nature. And it is also this particular tradition that empowered, even historically, women to the level of the great masters. For each master that is a man, the tradition produced a master who was a woman. Very special. Thus, feminism was well and alive in ancient times in a very spiritual form. Sumeru Madhyashringastha. She sits in the middle of Mount Sumeru. Sumeru is considered the world mountain, the universal mountain, like our spine, which is also called Meru in Sanskrit. So the name, of course, has two meanings again, or three at least, that she rests upon the world mountain, which represents simply everything, and also she rests in the center of our spine, because that is where the nadi, the energy channel, runs from the bottom of the spine to the top. And within that energy channel, the kundalini energy flows. So the Divine Mother is the kundalini energy that produces all our mental, emotional activity, but has to rise and come back to Shiva. And this rising process happens through the central channel in our spine. Those of you who are long-time meditators, you might sometimes feel some energy flowing up the spine and also down. There's a current flowing and this energy is known as prana and it is a kind of a precursor for the kundalini energy. This prana energy purifies the channel of all the blockages that have come about through negative emotions, negative deeds, 
through all the entanglements of karma. This channel is blocked and there are many different subtle energetic blockages there. So the prana begins to purify this. This is called Nadi Shodhana. And then the subtle Kundalini energy finally, of course, can begin to rise and to produce deeper and higher states of awareness. So this name also hints at this process. Shri Mannagaranayika. She is the queen or the leader of the most auspicious dwelling. And that, of course, is the Shri Chakra, as we have mentioned in our visualization before. If we look at the Shri Chakra, we will see that outside there is a square inside which are drawn three circles. And inside this are 16 petals arranged in a circle. And within these again are eight petals. And then in this fashion, the Sri Chakra is built almost like a city. And as I mentioned, it is the city where all the most auspicious qualities are present in the form of goddesses, yoginis. And she is the queen of this city, known as the Sri Nagara. This is also linked with the city of Sri Nagara in Kashmir today. The Sri Vidya tradition, after all, comes from Kashmir originally. Whence it travelled to South India about a thousand years ago. And I have myself never been to Srinagar, but I believe it is one of the most beautiful spots on earth. Or at least it was in the past. And we hope that one day one can go there again easily without troubles. So the outer Srinagara with its beautiful environment is a symbol of the Sri Chakra. Chintamani Grihantastha. She resides in the chamber built from the wish-fulfilling jewel. So the innermost part of the Sri Chakra palace is envisioned as a chamber of wish-fulfilling jewels, a gem capable of fulfilling every wish. Our own true nature fulfills every wish, makes us infinitely blissful, infinitely happy, so that finally there is nothing to wish for. Pancha Brahmasana Sthita. She sits on a seat made of five Brahmas. The five Brahmas are Sadashiva, Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra and Ishvara. These are different aspects of the divine. And she dwells upon these. And of course, Shiva himself also rests upon these and she sits upon Shiva. So these are symbolic images to express that they are the highest gods, but they are the bedposts. They are like the divan, the divan, or the sofa, we could say in modern language, 
they form the sofa upon which Shiva rests, and then she rests upon Shiva. So it all represents transcendence. Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Ishvara, the destroyer, they are all just her bedposts. Mahapadmata Visamstha. She resides in the great lotus wood. This was also mentioned in the visualization already and can be visualized externally as a lotus pond, but internally also represents, as I have mentioned, the thousand petaled lotus which is the highest chakra and the ultimate fulfillment of our path. When the Kundalini energy rises and reaches this thousand petaled lotus and merges with Shiva, then she rests, she resides in the great lotus forest or lotus wood. Kadamba Vanavasini. She resides in the forest of hibiscus flowers, also part of our visualization. Hibiscus flowers have this beautiful, beautiful reddish color, and they open up and they almost look a little bit like a Sri Chakra in their quality of having all these little details inside. Also my favorite flower is the hibiscus flower. Whereas you see roses for instance do not open up so splendorously. The hibiscus flower completely opens up with the morning sun and closes again a little bit in the evening. In the morning again opens up completely. So this complete opening up of the flower represents the utmost flowering of our being, the utmost blossoming of our mind, our heart, our wisdom. When it completely blossoms, it is like a hibiscus flower. That is why she rests in the garden of hibiscus flowers or the forest of hibiscus flowers. And finally for today, Sudha Sagara Madhyastha, she resides in the center of the ocean of nectar. Also part of our visualization. This boundless ocean that expands and extends in all the directions of space in which all universes arise like bubbles and seas like bubbles, in which all our thoughts and emotions arise and cease. This boundless ocean of nectar is her residence in the center of our heart. And all we need to do is turn our mind within, away from the outer obsessions, turn our mind within towards the vastness that is there. Here we finish for today and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Acharya Ji. Um, I just had a quick question about the significance of the nine levels in the visualization we do. Yes, so we will, in the course of the names, we will go through them because they are listed in the course of the names, their qualities are listed. So I can just give you a little short idea of their qualities. 
So the outermost is considered to be that which brings, which, which enchants the worlds. So it is like four portals into which we enter and it has the quality of magnetizing our mind. The specialty about the Srivitya tradition is that it brings a lot of bliss quite quickly. It brings a lot of joy quite quickly. So this is what we call the magnetizing or attracting aspect. And then the second layer is that which fulfills aspirations. So all the auspicious wishes that we have, such as Maitri, Karuna, the practices that we have, the auspicious wishes are fulfilled through this layer. And then in the third layer, we have to face our innermost challenges. That is why this one is known as the Sarvasankshobana layer, that which agitates everything. So in the course of practice, one faces these inner challenges, these inner ups and downs, the subconscious, we could say enemies, but they're not really enemies because they are ourselves our karmic debts and karmic difficulties that we have produced over many, many lives. That is what it is said. And then once we pass through this layer, we come to the all auspiciousness, where again, there are many, many goddesses and qualities residing. Then we come to Another layer where all material things are overcome, all attachments are overcome. And it is always through joy that they are overcome, through serenity, through bliss. And then the sixth layer is the one where we attain fearlessness, where we overcome all anxieties. We could say all emotional difficulties. And then the seventh one is the one where we overcome all illnesses, physical, emotional, mental illnesses. And the eighth layer is already almost the supreme, is the one where we achieve the absolute samadhi, the absolute concentration, the absolute clarity that is required to know our true nature. And then the ninth layer is that of absolute bliss. So this is just a little hint of these nine layers. I hope that was useful for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Namaste, Acharyaji. Yes, Devikaji. I'm not familiar with the term Shri Vidya tradition, and I know I missed the first few sessions right at the beginning. Um, so it's only if you mind just uh, describing or explaining what that means. Yes, so Shri Vidya is the name of the tradition of this particular form of Devi, known as Lalita Triprasundari. And I'm sure you have seen the Shri Chakra before, if not, then next time I will create a slide and I will project it onto the screen. Um, it is not so well visible on this picture here, but I will try. If you, oh dear, no, the lighting is not so good. I'm not sure you can see. Now my eyebrows are also visible. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very strange phenomenon. <laughs> ah, now maybe. Now, can you see? Yes. Below, can you see the, this, this geometric formation? Yes. This is known as the Shri Chakra. And this 
is a very complex uh, geometric formation. And ah, here is another one. Perhaps this is easier to yes. recognize. You might have seen it before. Yes? Um, I'm not sure I've seen it before. I mean, it's reminding me more of like <laughs> okay, okay. No, no, then you, you haven't uh, you haven't seen it. So this is a highly complex mandala. It's a highly complex ge uh, sacred geomet geometric form. And amber, of course, for you, this is interesting. And, and this is the particular tradition that emerged in Kashmir, in North India. Uh, initially, a quite a secretive meditative tradition where we visualize the, the body in connection with this geometric form. Very complex. We can go through this later in depth. Very esoteric also and requiring a lot of uh, concentrative abilities and secret mantras and syllables. So finally the whole body is divinized. So every part of the body is linked with this geometric form, quite complex. And through this, it's like a yogic process. Through this, our subtle energy body is purified and we then begin to experience deeper states of consciousness or greater serenity, greater peace, greater bliss. And the text we are studying is one of the core texts of this tradition known as Shri Vidya. Shri means splendorous, glorious, and Vidya means knowledge or wisdom. So, or it can also mean awareness. So it means splendorous awareness or glorious awareness. It's the very, very particular uh, tradition, like you have different traditions um, in North India. And then, interestingly, this tradition traveled from Kashmir towards South India. And today is in fact more prevalent in South India than in other areas of India. So it is not just a form of Mataji, you know, sort of not just a random form. It's a very, very complex system of meditation that requires in fact years of practice but I don't want to discourage anyone, but it, it requires years of practice and engagement to enter and to go into this tradition. It's uh, very interesting. But what we are studying now is the Lalita Sahasranama, the thousand names of the playful goddess, which, as you can see, is sort of a, a description of the best potential in us. And Devikaji, in this tradition, as I mentioned today, especially women are most empowered. So the great masters of this tradition were often women, more almost than men. So it is quite special in this regard that it is sort of among all the spiritual traditions, it is sort of the feminist tradition. Yes. Thank you so much, Acharya. And how old is this tradition? Well, in India, it's always a huge difficulty to give a historical date to anything. Because you see, the Indian sages said, well, we have perceived this in the subtle world, in our meditation, therefore it is eternal, or therefore it is millions of years old. Because how can you give a date to something that you are perceiving coming to you from the subtle world. And we can't deny that these experiences happen. People have visions. People have deep, profound encounters with spiritual truths. But, of course, the modern mind asks this question from the side of the human. Mm -hmm. from, where, from which date onwards do we find evidence of this tradition being practiced, isn't it? Right? Yeah, yeah. So we ask it from this side, whereas the sages who are perceiving that, no, none of these sages ever said they invented or created it. They always said, we were sitting in deep meditation when this geometric form arose. And from this form, gods and goddesses arose and they gave, they sort of uh, let teachings flow into our mind. This is the way 
how all the traditions emerged in India, not just this one, all the traditions, also Krishna traditions or Vishnu tradition, they all emerged in a visionary way. That is why they are called Rishis. A Rishi is a, a seer, a visionary. And even today in Tibet, masters are still seeing things, right? And also in India, I'm sure there are such masters as well, who are still seeing new forms like this emerging. But to answer your question in a more academic way, there is evidence of Sri Vidya for about, I think, from the 6th century onwards, 6th or 7th century onwards. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then someone asks, Namaste, Sri Chakra is worshipped by the business community for material profits. Um, as advised by the gurus. Well, this is a very, this is going to be very mean by me. That's only in Gujarat. <laughs> it's very mean, but it's true that in Gujarat, it is surprising that indeed the gentleman is right. This extremely, what for us is such a spiritual depth, mysteriously became a, a sort of a symbol for if you have this in your house, you will be rich. And perhaps there's some truth to it as well. I have often seen that people who, you know, deeply meditate on this somehow, strangely, also become successful in life. One of our friends just now, also a Gujarati, of course, um, he has been meditating on this and suddenly he got a great job, a really great job in the middle of this pandemic. Now, I'm, I'm just joking now, but perhaps there is some truth as well that that if if you concentrate on this and you have a certain aspiration and if like with many Gujaratis, if not most, your aspiration is to be rich, perhaps that result will happen, you see. But if your aspiration is to gain spiritual peace and to gain spiritual insight, then that will happen. Yes? I'm sorry to all the Gujaratis out there. Then someone asks, is Sri Vidya connected to forms of Buddhism? Uh, it's a very good question. In fact, this is our Sri Vidya manual. And in fact, the, the Buddhist goddess Tara is one of the aspects of Tiprasundri, and in here, one of the six aspects uh, is actually Buddhism. It's very interesting. She's she's described as the Bauddha Darjana Dishtatri. Among six other traditions, she's said to be uh, one of the inspirers of the Buddhist tradition. So yes, there is a connection to Buddhism. Absolutely. Yes. And then someone says, in South India, we have the perception that Gujaratis are rich people. Yes, <laughs> it is. There's a truth to that as well. So when we concentrate on this symbolism and our aspiration is wealth, perhaps it helps. Who knows? But always remember that wealth is also temporary. So if you only concentrate on wealth, it is sort of a waste of your life. So maybe just keep it as one aspect of your many different activities and, and aspirations. Finally, someone says, I think what we seek, we get. Yes, exactly. So whatever we place our ambition and aspiration towards, that is ultimately the result we will get. So be careful what you wish for. Make sure that your wishes and aspirations are auspicious and that they are in the direction of wisdom and in the direction of universal benefit. And then that is what we will hopefully get. Our I try it. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, I have another question. I just wanted to show, um, I was just doing a watercolor painting of uh, Devi, of Tripura uh, Sundariji. Yes. So I was just inspired and I couldn't vocalize anything, so I thought I'd just um, draw and paint it. So let me, let me, let me spotlight you. Hold on a moment. I'm not good at spotlighting it's people. Yes. So very nice. Very nice. That reminds me of Kamakshi, of Kamakshi, of the, 
the form that is found in the South, South India temple mm -hmm. in, in Kanchipuram. Wonderful. How both the legs are in full lotus. So, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So you, you can also see this form here. Yeah, very similar to the one you've drawn. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let me not extend the time. Thank you, everyone. And then see you soon. And be full of the bliss that we have described. All right. Have a great week ahead of you.